to talk to you today about the next iteration of Unify. Do we have anyone here that has heard of or uses Unify in their applications? All right, that's awesome. So I'm gonna today, uh, today I'm going to talk about our path to 2.0. We have some new features and functionality coming. Um, for those who don't know who I am, my name is John Lear. I'm the creator of Unify. I've been uh, working in Vue since uh, early 2014 when it was still in alpha. And I've been working on Vuetify since uh, July of 2016. Now, if you don't know what Vuetify is, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, we're a component framework. Uh, we utilize Google's material design spec uh, to build our components. Uh, we had our first public alpha in 2016, so we've been around for a little bit. We have some cool functionality like full SSR support. And right now, I think we're around 80 unique components. Uh, we have some really advanced and uh, minimalistic functionality spread across um, these components, and it's really awesome things like data tables and date time pickers, etc. If you want some more information while I'm talking, you can go to beautifyjs.com and take a look at our whole stack. Uh, but right now, I want to talk to you about uh, building a better framework. So we've had a lot of time inside of uh, working with Beautify, and we've learned a lot of lessons in that time. And we wanted to really come back for 2.0 and, and introduce some of the pain points that uh, developers were having when they were using our framework. And uh, we kind of broke it down into four pillars. Uh, the, the first pillar is customization. So we have some good customization options right now, but we're looking to improve that. If you've ever worked in the framework, uh, some high-level configuration items like icon fonts and language already exist. But if you want to do something like, uh, I want all of my form components to be the outline style, or I want to disable ripples in my entire application, you kind of have to do that on your own. So we're looking to provide some additional high-level uh, configuration for that. Material Design 2 was released a couple months ago, actually, when we were working on our 1.1 release. And it introduced a lot of new features and functionality that we're going to be bringing into to version 2. And one of those things is uh, custom themes. So not everyone's application and not everyone's mock-up is going to fit within the Material Design uh, spec. It's not going to look like it. You sometimes need to make some small alterations. So we're going to be giving you the ability to do that. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then the next thing is the Vue CLI UI. Um, if you haven't used the Vue CLI 3, um, command line plugin, it is absolutely amazing and it gives a lot of power to developers to uh, kind of craft these great experiences for other users. And uh, we're going to be offering full Vue CLI UI implementation so you'll be able to actually modify your Beautify application from within it as opposed to doing it within the code if that's what you would like to do. Uh, the next thing is performance. So um, I know Evan talked earlier today about tree shaking and it's something we call a la carte in Beautify. Um, but it's something that we take very serious and we've been hard at work. Um, I'm actually bringing this up now because we released it with 1.3. Um, but with the Beautify Loader, which if you install Beautify through the Vue CLI 3 uh, plugin, automatically tree shakes your application. So one of the big uh, issues with a component framework is you're always going to grow horizontally. No matter what you do, uh, no matter how much you optimize, you're going to get bigger. Um, but not everyone uses all of those components. In fact, about 50% of the components uh, we find uh, people use or don't use with their application. And you can actually get that right now, where essentially you, whatever component you use is the only thing that ends up in your application. So it results in much smaller bundle sizes. And uh, we've also been working on optimizations across all device sizes. We already support mobile uh, up to a large desktop. Um, but sometimes, depending upon the performance of those devices, the experience can change. And we're working on that to uh, make it a much better process and feel throughout. Uh, funny, we had the accessibility conversation earlier, uh, lots of excitement. Um, we already support accessibility, but we can do better. So we went back, we're actually working with the uh, community leaders and members on, we're going to have, uh, we started one uh, RTL support in 1.1, um, but we're going to have full RTL support by uh, version 2.0. It includes things like Section 508 compliance, which if you're working for any government agencies you might be familiar with, and we'll be following the uh, web content accessibility guidelines when we redevelop our components to ensure that we're being as accommodating to a large, cloud, uh, large audience of people as possible. And then uh, last is support. Uh, it doesn't really matter how good the framework is if you can't get help or you don't know how to do things. And that's one of the things that I, I pride, us, pride us on. We have a very engaged uh, Discord community, uh, subreddit, and um, we want to make sure that we continue to bring that kind of feel for users so whenever you're stuck on something, you're not just kind of having to make a post issue on GitHub or trying to sit there and wait till you can figure it out. Um, so we're going to be bringing weekly patches. We kind of already do this right now, but weekly patches every single week, uh, taking care of bug, is, bug issues and a couple other changes, as well as daily canary builds if you're on the bleeding edge and you want to check out uh, some of the new features that we're working on. Um, and then also, we're going to be bringing long-term support. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then continuing to engage
engage with the community. Uh, community is a really big thing for us. We want to make sure that developers have a, a good environment to create their applications and to get help whenever they need it. So talking more about the configuration options, if you've worked in Beautify um, before, uh, you can already define your theme colors at the top, um, in, in the top config. But that really doesn't work if your application is set to be able to swap between dark and light. Maybe you might pick light or dark, but if you swap between the two, usually your, your colors won't translate between them. So we're going to be offering the ability for you to define this within your application easily. Um, the custom theme presets, I touched on that for Material Design 2, will be including all the ones that Google has uh, supplied within their spec, but we're also going to be giving you a better avenue of approach to doing it yourself. Um, while that is possible now, it's not easy, and there's not always a good path for it, so we're going to make sure that you have a good process. And then, again, the macro-level configuration, removing ripples, uh, making inputs specify, uh, use a specified style, uh, modifying grid breakpoints. Uh, you know, material design hasn't defined a grid breakpoint, but maybe that doesn't fit your application. So we're going to offer the ability for you to change that. We're also changing our bootstrap method. If you've ever worked with Beautify in any type of uh, testing tooling, uh, you may have ran into some issues due to how we bootstrap. So we're actually changing the process. It'll be very similar to how you hook up View Router and Vuex into your application. So talking about drawing up the code base, one of the things that we've seen as we've worked in that uh, framework for so long is that we have this real duplicated functionality that exists throughout multiple components. But it's really just a different paint job. On this code. They, they share the same thing. So let's take a, a couple of um, components from the framework. We've got tabs, carousels, steppers, expansion panels, and a toggle button. So when we look at these individually, they look completely different when you're working with them in the application or going through the documentation and putting them in your. Um, but they kind of share the same functionality. Um, so what we started to do is break out this core functionality that creates these components and not only give us a way to uh, easily maintain them, um, but also give them to the developers. So if you don't like the way we do our carousels, it's fine, just, just make your own. Um, and it's a very easy process, and it kind of also helps us to um, increase the, uh, the testability of our framework um, and avoid something I call component fragmentation. Um, so when we look at the components, we try to figure out what is the scope. It's very easy to get what I call a trap component where um, it does way too much. It does more than it's supposed to, and things just keep getting added to it and added to it, as opposed to extending upon it. So let's take a toolbar. It's a very common component. Uh, most applications are going to have it. Um, and uh, it has, it's what I call a paper component. It has elevation. You can change its color. Um, it can be a dark or light theme. It's measurable, so it has a size. It's a, in the case of a toolbar, it's a height. In the case of a navigation drawer, maybe a width. And it's, it's scrollable, so it, it interacts with the scrolling of the user if you want it to. And it's also an application component. And what I mean by an application component is in Beautify, um, you can actually take top level components and specify them that they are application level, and your content area will automatically adjust. So you don't have to worry about configuring any type of special CSS, it's just going to work. But when we take, all, we take this functionality and, and abstract it, we realize that there's really a baseline that we can start from. And then again, be able to provide more functionality for the developer. So if you don't like the way that we do something, you can take our core structure and do it however you'd like. Um, but it also gives us a better avenue for testing and maintainability because um, in all reality, navigation drawer, toolbar, system bar, footer, bottom nav, these are kind of material design spec uh, lingo, but they're application level components that all share the same kind of functionality. They're paper, they can change their color, they, they take up the application state. So we're just trying to reduce component fragmentation, which is you have the similar functionality that exists in multiple different ways throughout your components, um, but they're just a little bit different. So we're just trying to bring it in so that it's a lot easier to uh, test and also to give the developers some more uh, toys to play with. Uh, we've completely updated the structure. So it's a common trend. You uh, heard Evan talk about monorepos. Um, we have recently converted to a monorepo to not only make it easier for us to develop on, but a big thing is, as an open source project, is getting developers to be able to contribute. If, if, you're, if it's very confusing to get in there and play with things, then people generally just don't want to do it. So converting over to a monorepo has definitely helped that. Um, our core is being rebuilt from the ground up uh, with TypeScript in mind. We, uh, TypeScript for us was kind of a bolt-on that started about four or five months ago, and we have converted about 80% of the framework 
Uh, but with the rebuild, uh, from the ground up, everything is being built with TypeScript. So you're going to have that support in your, your code editors. Um, we're also moving from a Boreas to view test utils. If you've never heard of a Boreas, it's actually the same author, um, Ed. And uh, we've, we were on it early on before view test utils was a thing, so we'll be converting over that. So if you're working in the framework helping you contribute, you'll have a similar interface that you probably deal with whenever you're working in your application. And finally, we're moving from Stylus to SCSS. We've been on Stylus for quite a while now, and it is a, a great piece of software, but the community has definitely spoken out, and we're going to be moving. We're actually working with a community member who's already converted the framework to SCSS, and we're going to bring this within to the new version. So a richer ecosystem. So having great tools to coincide with the framework is a really important aspect for us. Uh, the, you hear me talk a lot about the Vue CLI 3 plugin. It's a very powerful tool that's enabling us to create some truly um, awesome, engaged experiences for developers when they're doing anything from setting up their application to maintaining it to making changes. Um, we're going to be offering, well, we already offer right now in the CLI, uh, just like whenever you use to Vue CLI 3 to create a project, you kind of go through a process where you can select uh, predefined defaults or you can create your own. But we offer the same functionality, so we have a lot of uh, bootstrapping features that you can actually do from the UI now, um, or you could just select a default as opposed to having to decide on your own. Um, Vue CLI 3 also supports uh, remote presets. Uh, remote presets are a little bit different, at least uh, from the presets that are saved locally that you handle with Vue. It actually allows us to kind of scaffold out the entire project structure for you, and you can put in one command and you have the entire application with Vuetify ready to go in just under a minute. And then the CLI. So they've given us the ability to hook in and actually utilize the CLI aspects of Vue CLI. So we're going to be working on uh, what I call in Vuetify CLI that allows you to easily scaffold your project. If you've ever worked in Laravel or uh, similar projects like Django, where you can simply type something like create a component or create this and just kind of scaffolds it for you, uh, you're going to be able to do that right out of the box. And you'll also be able to designate your component structure it may not be the same as what we do in our, our framework, so maybe you want the file structure to look different. You'll be able to do that, and it'll be very easy to be able to just say create a component, and it goes in the right place, has a unit test, and is ready to go. So Vuex modules. Uh, so the first one, uh, if you've worked in any type of Amazon Web Services or heard of, heard of Cognito, it's an authentication service, um, and it's actually uh, a critical part to a project I'm about to talk about here in a few minutes. Um, but basically, uh, we're going to be releasing a subset of tools and Vuex modules to help enhance your application. Uh, Cognito is actually being headed by our community manager, Brandon Dio, and uh, it's going to actually be out this month with a full project where you can literally be off the ground in a few minutes and have user authentication through Amazon Web Services. Um, things like a snack bar notification queue, if you've been in Beautify, you've probably heard people ask about why can I not have multiple snack bars, why can I do it like this or do it like that. And, most of the time, the answer comes down to, well, that's not in the spec. Uh, but we're, we're getting better about that, and we're going to be offering some additional functionality. Um, Snack RQ, uh, Vuetify Sync. If you've used uh, Vue Router and uh, uh, Vuex with the Sync module, what that allows you to basically put the router's state within your store, we're going to offer the same thing for our core service functionality, things like the application layout. layout and the breakpoints, um, so that it's easier for you to debug your application when you're working in Beautify and kind of taking away some of the hidden stuff that you don't really understand how it works. Uh, providing additional development resources. Um, we're working on a large subset of guides and articles coming into version 2.0 to really highlight some of the uh, features and functionality that's coming with it, but also to make it a more common occurrence where you can get information on how to use the framework, uh, video tutorials, and we're actually working on a newsletter to, to provide updates within the ecosystem. We, we move pretty quick in Beautify, so it's really easy to, to um, get behind on the information that's going throughout. So we're trying to make sure that we have an outlet to properly get that out to users. And then the last thing I was going to talk about for the ecosystem is Beautify SNPs. Now this is a, a project we've been working on for a little bit. I'm very excited for. Um, this is another project that uh, Brandon Dio is working on. And essentially, in our Discord community, we have this I Made This channel. And, and developers come up with some really amazing things, and we love to share them with, uh, with community members. But we wanted a way for people to be able to easily share that and create their own. Uh, Beautify essentially is a really composition-based framework where you can just put things inside of other things like working with Legos. So it's, it's really neat to be able to see what users are creating. And uh, that's something that we want to bring out and make sure that it's accessible for everyone around the world. And that's something that we're going to be releasing next year, uh, quarter two. 
Um, some of the new components now, uh, some of these are going to probably be out this year, some are going to coincide with 2.0. And uh, this is something that we were a little bit nervous about at first because we didn't have the ability to properly tree shake the application and it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But now that we have that, it's, it's really uh, it's comforting to us because we can start to tackle some of the, the bigger components that we really wanted to put in the framework, something like a calendar, which is very robust, but really large in size. And if you don't need it, it's kind of taking up space. Um, but we have some more things like spark lines and file upload, discovery overlay. These are all built with the material design spec in mind, but they're not actually in the spec. So, we're kind of going to provide a, a more richer base of things to select from so that you don't have to grab from a bunch of different plugins or, or components. You can come to one spot and you kind of have everything ready to go. And then last thing, long-term support. So it's really important for us to make sure that the applications that you're building are supported. We kind of already do this in a sense, but we've never really publicly announced it. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now, starting with version 2.0. The last miner of Unify will be supported for major bugs and security vulnerabilities for the next 18 months. And we will continue that trend with every single major release, ensuring that whenever you build your application, you're not worried if the developer is going to disappear and it's no longer supported. You don't have to worry about that. You'll have the peace of mind. And then that kind of concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank our supporters. We have a very large community that gives us a lot of backing and it makes it possible to do what we do. And I'm very appreciative of that. And I just wanted to give them a little highlight to say thank you. And uh, since this is my first public presentation, I wanted to uh, say you know, I've had the unique opportunity to stand on the shoulders of some very talented developers, uh, Albert, Jasek, and Kale, um, in building the framework. And I thought it was prudent to recognize them here because they're very crucial to its success. And thank you. That's it for me.